Welcome back to the Photo Banter Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Gagne, and on today's podcast, I welcome on photographer Timothy Archibald. Timothy is a photographer based in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's been a working commercial and editorial photographer for over 25 years and is also the professor of photography at the Academy of Art in San Francisco. In this interview, I speak to Timothy about his early days in photography, um, working at a newspaper, and I also speak to him about his recent project, the AI Camera Club, which is a series of AI images he's been working on. It's like a narrative fiction. Um, so I kind of just talked to him about what got him into working with AI and how that's been and much, much more. Um, hope you guys enjoy this episode. And like I said last week, the episode, if you want the video version, you can go to YouTube now. It's just the Photo Banter YouTube. Uh, definitely go check that out. And if you'd like to su subscribe, that'd be a big help. Um, but yeah, it's just the Photo Banter on YouTube. Uh, but as always, thanks so much for listening. Take care. All right. I now welcome on long awaited Timothy Archibald. Excited to have you, man. Uh, for years, uh, Jonathan Saunders, photographer. Uh, he's been uh, he's been like you got to interview Timothy you got to interview Timothy so he, he, a lot of requests for you man so excited to have you on here oh I am so excited to be on here I love Jonathan I haven't talked to him in a little while but I feel like I'm always his biggest fan you know do you have like a large like creative community like photographers you kind of keep in touch with or not so much or like Oh, you know, uh, definitely I did. And then I feel like when I was just a freelance photographer, making all those connections was a big deal. And I had like friends who were in New York and I'm in San Francisco. And I was always trying to find an excuse to meet other photographers because I think I'm just interested in, I'm interested in who does this and yep. the entire scope, like, be you someone who shoots with a pinhole camera or be you a wedding photographer or you're shooting senior portraits or big ad campaigns. I, I just like the practitioners of this craft. And uh, but uh, in 2020, I started um, working at an art school in San Francisco. And when I did that, I felt like suddenly I was submerged in this community of photographers, like the students, the other faculty that are there. Um, and so I feel like suddenly that gave me this community. And so I'm probably less outward facing than I used to be, if that makes sense, you know. Yeah, I saw that. And it looks like your new project, Sutter Street. I could be wrong, but it looks like it's just like portraits of like art students and the people that you're kind of teaching at your school there at the, what, what is it, the San Francisco Art Center? What It's called the... Oh, it's called the Academy of Art University in Got San it, Francisco. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What is that kind of that work? Is that pretty much just kind of the people you're running into at your workplace kind of? Oh, that is. Yeah. And what it was, was when I started that job 2020, um, you know, we had, it was January 2020. And I was like, oh my God, here I'm in San Francisco and I am like taking a cable car to work and teaching at this art school. And then it all came to an immediate close in March with COVID. And then we were teaching online and it was all the struggles of that period, you know. And when we came back slowly, I think I saw the school anew, you know, like, like every room we were in with unusual things was fascinating and all the students seemed beautiful to me. <laughs> and like just that humanity that we had been so starved from, I felt like I wanted to capture it you know? And so now I kind of do that project in a more passive way, but there was a period, like all projects, I feel like there's periods where you're gearing up for it. There's periods where you're grabbing the fish out of the river and it's very easy. And then there's periods where you're like, oh, am I still doing this? I guess I am. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. I feel like that. I have a project I've been doing forever, like my baseball project. And it's like, no, I don't even know. I'm like, sometimes I'm shooting. I'm like, I don't know why I'm still doing this. I like it, but it's like, I feel like I'm just kind of taking the same picture at a certain point, but I keep doing it for some reason, you know? <laughs> well, you know, that's human nature. I saw those black and white portraits of baseball players that you had done this summer. Mm -hmm. Is that the project? Yeah, I've been doing it for like 15 years. Those are beautiful. Thanks. Those are beautiful. But I think the thing with uh, anybody's project that we all wrestle with is, finding a project is really, really hard. Yeah. So the idea of ending it, who wants to end it? You want to hang on to that thing, you know? Yeah. It, I struggle with that too. Cause I'm like, I, I've been having that thought a lot lately. I'm like, I, it's like, uh, I don't, I would imagine it's like a band, like you got your hits, but it's like, you got to keep making more music or you got to keep making more stuff. You can't, it's like, at least for me, I'm like, I gotta, 
because I like I said, I like doing it, but I'm like, man, I gotta like find something else and like challenge myself because I, I feel like I can just get stuck in like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. Like it's like I got my bag of tricks, I know how it works, but it's like, how am I progressing? You know? It is, yeah, that's tricky. And then the comfort of not having to find a new project, but you've already paved the way of how this one gets done. You know, it's hard to let go of that and then be like, oh, now it's going to be something new. You know? Yeah. Um. And, you know, I'm excited to talk to you. I know we've been going back and forth on Instagram. You have, uh, I've been roasting you uh, just for, for fun, but it, uh, you've been doing this thing called the AI Camera Club. It's like this separate Instagram account that you've been doing. How long have you been doing it for? Like a year or two or? Oh, a year and a half. I started in May of 2023. And it's so like AI, AI, like imagery, and you use like a, uh, like a pseudo name. It's like a couple different ones, like Allison, uh, what is her last name? It's uh, uh, yeah. In preparing for this, I, you know, I've been working on the thing for so long for preparing this. I was like, Ooh, I better remember the different photographers I created. <laughs> yeah. Right now, Allison Sinclair is yeah. the photographer, this fictional photographer I created. And then looking at the work, can you tell who she is kind of emulating? Mm, let me pull it up i guess i haven't looked at it i looked at it but i guess i'd have to look at it close more closely uh let's see here AI. i mean only a true photo nerd will pick up on this but people have picked up on it but there are some serious photo nerds out there you know? all right let me pull it up and people can look at it but yeah i guess what kind of got you into this ai stuff because i know it's like top of mind for everyone and it's like a some people love it. Some people hate it. There's a lot of a lot of emotions going in with the AI stuff now. Oh, but... for sure. <laughs> Everyone hates it. Um, no, no, no. Everyone hates it. And I hated it, too. Um, you know, it's funny. As photographers, we're always told that we got to pivot to the next thing. You know, like there was a period where we were all supposed to learn how to do video. Yep. You know, the five and I remember. Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like such a uh, old school kind of photographer. I was like, I don't want to do that, you know, and I, I did successfully dodge that enough to kind of stay away from it, or I wouldn't do it myself. If I if there was a big job, and we needed motion, I would hire a director of photography, you know, and so I, I kind of got out of that. Uh, and then I think the last one was NFTs and we were all supposed to be cranking out NFTs and getting rich, <laughs> you know what I mean? And like <laughs> pimping them on the internet, getting people to buy them, you know? And yeah. so I, I got out of that, you know, uh, dodged that one. <laughs> and, you know, of course, when I saw AI, I hated every science fiction looking photo that I saw, you know, like dragons on Mars and, you know, otherworldly things, you know, but this picture right here that we're looking at that I'll describe to the readers or to the listeners, it's a bear dressed like a man holding two very primitive looking cameras. It almost looks like a man wearing a bear suit, maybe. Yeah. Um, this was an early picture I made that I, I loved. And there was something about messing around with AI that I had nothing to lose, you know, like I hated the medium, everything I saw that it was being done with it, I hated. <laughs> and so for me to mess around with it, I didn't, I, I could be bad at it. Or you, no one could be good at it or no one could be bad at it because it was so new, you know? And I did find that, that that beginner's mindset, that feeling that you could try something without the fear of failure, I really liked, you know? Like I found it liberating and I do feel that like, so I am 57 and I have, you know, been a photographer in different ways since I was 14 years old, you know, like working as a photojournalist at one period and then trying to be the commercial photographer. And now I'm into education and still working commercially. So I've always had my foot in these things and nothing had ever seemed new and exciting to me. Like I have friends who are photographers where when the new camera comes out, they love it and it's exciting to them and it allows them to make new photographs that they've never made before. And I, I never, you know, I never bought the new camera. I never bought the new Canon. You know, I, I didn't, I, I was just a creature of habit, you know? And so that kind of feeling excitement with a new medium in something that I was ready to hate got my attention, you know? So, no, so now you don't hate it. You love it. No, I think you can hate something. <laughs> There's no way 
2024, a, a photographer cannot hate AI. Would mm-hmm. you agree? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I was I was like having a lunch with my friend yesterday, and she's a producer at an agency, and she's telling me about this client I've been working with, and like, yeah, they're using AI for this stuff now. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> like, yeah, who's buying lunch today? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so it is. No, of course I hate it. And then now, even because I'm teaching, I'm teaching a class in it, AI for visual artists. But I mean, there's no denying we got to embrace not we don't have to embrace it, but it's going to hit the meteor is going to hit the planet no matter what, you know? Yeah. Because do, do you think because just talking to you and then look, looking at your work, it seems like a lot of your stuff, you're a people person, like all your works about people. It's like interacting oh, yeah. with people, even the Sutter Street stuff, like you're approaching people on the street. It looks like can you get the same fulfillment out of like creating like an AI imagery as like making a traditional photograph, you think? Uh, what do you think? No. What do you think? <laughs> Absolutely know. not. No, 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 <laughs> no. And it's interesting that, you know, so, okay, here's this new medium. Of course, we all hate it. And then I started to use it. And I was like, you know, this is as fun as a slot machine. You know, like a slot machine to me is not fun at all. Like you're pushing a button and getting something handed to you that usually means you lose, you know? And so, I no, there was no satisfaction. And yeah, I'm the people person i like the experience of meeting the person and being in their home or being at a location and trying to understand them and try to get them to like me in a little 20 minute appointment or something like that so no i'm into that arc of those engagements um and i think yeah originally playing with ai i was like this is nothing like that there's no payoff there's no human anything but I'm trying to think why, uh, what was the pull that suddenly made it like, oh, here, I'm going to dedicate a year and a half to this, you know, or if not two years and <laughs> not my whole life, you know, um, uh, I think you have to let go of it being photography and you have to embrace that it is like an illustration or it is a, a graphic creation. And like my thing here they're informed by the history of photography. But like, even when you look at them on a big screen, well, they're not, I mean, they're photographic, maybe in the same way a photorealist painting might be or something, you know? Um, So they're informed by photography. They're trying to emulate tintype-ish type photos from the set in the 1940s. So they're informed by that, but no, as a creator, it has none of the pull that taking a photograph of a human does. What it does though, is for me, it allowed me to tell a story and kind of create this little fictional world. You know, my world is a, what do I call it? The AI camera club, which is an imaginary imaginary camera club in the 1940s. And then we're looking at the work of all the different photographers. And so it allows me to kind of tap into my love for the history of photography tell some stories, make unusual images, uh, interesting images, and maybe just experiment with this medium that was so new, you know? Yeah, I think, like, the funny thing doing this interview, and I told you beforehand, like, I've been aware of you and your work for over 15 years. Like, I remember, like, I told you, I know your your friend uh, Thomas Broning, who's another photographer in the Bay Area, and I, I was in college, and I remember, like, you guys had blogs. That's like when blogs were like mid 2000s. You guys had blogs. Yeah. I remember being in college and like reading your guys shit. And uh, it was just like a cool time period. But like seems like you've always been open to embracing like new stuff, be it like social media or blogging. And now you're doing the AI stuff. You're kind of maybe you won't do it forever, but you you, you at least want to like test it out and try try the new technologies and stuff. I think so. I mean, the blogging, it is true that, yeah, the early days of blogging before Facebook came and before Instagram came, it was almost kind of like what you're doing Mm -hmm. here with your podcast. Like it allowed someone, there was no one doing it. So if you simply did it, you got attention. You know, if you simply wrote about photography, you got attention. Oh, it was it was awesome. I used to like read your guys' blogs. Like Thomas, he would do like uh, he would do, basically do like BTS of his photo shoots. And I remember like oh, yeah. as yeah, a yeah. young as a young kid, like in like college, I remember seeing like he had like pro photo packs. And in my mind, I was like, holy shit, this guy owns pro photo. This is yeah. nuts. He like this guy's the real deal. And I was like, I yeah. watched your guys' stuff, and you guys were like doing it. It it was just kind of like the storytelling of being a photographer. 
Yeah, well, you know who's obviously does that so well right now is um, what's his name? That Hollywood photographer, uh, Art. Um, oh, Stry- oh, Stryber. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess, mean, but he really, I, he he'll show you. Yeah, I guess like the little bit technical setups and stuff. But you guys were like went way more into depth of like writing about the experience and like more. I feel like more of a kind of not just a glimpse, I guess. Oh, we tried to, yeah, we were kind of snotty and we kind of also with that probably felt we had nothing to lose so we could make fun of the industry a little bit, you know what I mean? And say something sucked if it really did. And yeah, yeah, I'm sure that helped our careers immensely. But it did, uh, it was, yeah, probably the thrill I got from writing a blog and being able to shine the light on different photographers and attract attention is probably, yes, you could say it's a parallel to uh the ai thing i don't know if it's <laughs> the ai thing is not attracting positivity it's g- engendering negativity but <laughs> it is it's a new thing to try you know so oh yeah but i mean even as much as i was roasting you like i i'm not like anti ai by no stretch like i'm using ai tools now with the podcast with editing the audio and stuff and it's like these incredible tools that are only going to get better and you're it's still like the early days so like p- people that yeah. are, people do not like change like whatever it is they just do not like it so it's like oh yeah I, I think it's great that like you're trying it like even like even yourself like talking it seems like you're you're not it's not like you're like some giant ai fan but you're at least willing to like dabble and just try it out yeah here's this thing that none of us understand and then it's almost like well who's making these images is satan making them you know like (laughs) every time we type something into this like who's assembling these things and why do they look so good you know and so there's a there is something that's breathtaking you know it's funny i've i found the medium to be interesting you know to me a big thing was so i love the history of photography and what I probably got me hooked was like, do you know Lewis Hine? Who oh, Lewis yeah. Hine is? Yep. So who is Lewis Hine? He was like a photographer. He, he photographed like workers and stuff, like black and white. Yeah. Like or, yeah. Yeah, kids working in factories yeah, in yeah. whatever era that was, the the twenties or something. Yep. And so I always loved his photographs. I thought the kids looked fascinating and the locations, these giant factories were so beautiful and it was natural light. And so I think when I realized I could kind of type prompts in that said, you know, 1927, dirty factory, kid, you know, 10 year old kid holding camera inspired by Lewis Hine and get something. It was just like, wow, look at that, you know, and like, like, and you're in a factory and then you could say clean factory and suddenly it's clean. You could say filthy, messy, messy factory with broken machines and then it's that and then so that storytelling and the ability to like suddenly bring people into this fictional world that's very addictive you know and then I think for me it it probably felt more like a writing class you know where it's like you come up with someone okay there's going to be a lighting class in this school this AI camera club they're going to have a lighting class well, what's their studio going to look like? Well, it's just going to be an empty field in, in, you know, behind a supermarket. Oh, okay. Well, let's see what that looks like. And then, oh, well, who's the best student in the class? The best student in the class's work looks like this. And then, oh, who's the worst student in the class? Well, the worst student in the class, you know, it, uh, it's an old guy who's can, who came in to sit into the class and this is what he looks like. And then, oh, here's a member of the club who's 100 years old. Let's take a picture of him. So it really was, you could use your kind of storytelling skills and let the kind of family tree evolve, you know. I think it's great. Um, I feel like I don't know if you feel this way, like uh, like yourself, like you've been a working photographer for decades, and now you're teaching. And some weird happens, like when you make photography your career. I actually think it can kind of make you like like way less creative. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh like, yeah, like you're yeah, like you're yeah. talking about like, oh yeah, when the new camera comes out, like people are like, I got to get that. It's like keeping up with yeah. the Joneses, and I'm just like. I'm like 16 years into this now. And the further I go along, I'm like, I'm trying to like, it's funny that I do a podcast, but I'm trying to like not look at a lot of what other people are doing. Cause it's just like, you start to think like you got to make work like this and keep up with them. But it's like, in reality, it's just photography is a tool and it's use it however you want. But I think at least for me, when it becomes your professional thing, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but like, it, it's just, it's a lot of like keeping up with other people and and you, you feel like you got to do something one way, you know? 
Oh, for sure. Like, I think when I had a community of photographers, someone would get the new Canon and then suddenly you would feel, you know, you'd see it and then you'd use it and you'd be like, oh man, this is better than mine. This one can make movies. Mine can't make it. So you'd, you know, have to buy that thing. And yeah, there was that feeling. And, you know, the one thing I did feel was that in the commercial photography world, it almost got to the point where everything was retouched and everything had dramatic skies and everything was perfect and there was no bad photographs anymore. Like there, there weren't any, like, <laughs> like it was all great. And then when it's all great, it's like, well, where do you see the thing that's, you know, like, I remember I was goofing around with uh, Carrie Shaw, one of the other photographers that my agent represents. And we said like, oh, if we ever saw a photographer's work that was terrible, we would immediately hire them. What? <laughs> what are you really? Well, because if it's terrible, that means that it's original. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. There, there's, there's nothing that's even terrible anymore. Like, it's all great, you know, mm -hmm. and it's all breathtaking. It's like every iPhone comes out, blows your mind. Do you know what I mean? Well, didn't the one that was the, did the iPhone 10 blow your mind? Like, your mind needs to be blown even more, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I kind of feel like with AI and everything, you know, Brooke Embry, my agent, she was like, eh, the next thing is going to be the most raw, ugly, primitive photographs a photographer can make. Like the march to perfectionism has happened. <laughs> you know what oh, I mean? I, it's it, even like in videography, like uh, like DV, like film, like uh, camcorder shit is like coming back. Like people like using those cameras again. And I've seen like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's like retro and all this stuff. So it's, it's funny to watch. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's uh, I think even looking at your work, your best work, at least for me, it's not about some technical thing. It's about like your idea and like some story. And like, it wouldn't matter if you shot it with the first Canon 5D or if you had the new mirrorless, it, it wouldn't it, it wouldn't affect the work, I don't think. Yeah, probably not with me. There are photographers, though, where that technical precision shines through and becomes fascinating. And, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, so yeah, I, I guess I have a respect for what everybody's doing, really, you know, um, but it is, yeah, I don't know. It is the AI thing did suddenly give us something to reckon with, you know, like, well, how old are you? Uh, 39. 39. So you've only shot digital. Oh, no, beginning. I can't. Right. I came up with film because I started shooting like in the 90s. So you started shooting. OK, so you came up with film and like shooting transparency film. Yep. E6. Kind of yeah. 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 Waiting for the stuff to get processed and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. No, you did. So we have the similar kind of arc to that. Because mm -hmm. um, it was interesting. I was talking to these students and I was saying like, oh, you know, I look through a file cabinet I have and I come across like the most boring shoot you've ever seen. But it was shot on film. And you look at the, the contact sheet of the film and you're just like, it's beautiful. You know, it's, it's so luscious and so organic and it has all these qualities. And I remember the student said like, well, are you just romanticizing and sentiment, making it sentimental? Or do you think visually it looks different? And I was like, eh, I, I don't know, you know. What, what do your students think about AI and stuff? And are they shoot? It seems like it's films like a big thing and now again, but like what what's the that that must be interesting with your job. You kind of get a pulse of like the new generation of like what they're interested in and what they're thinking. Like wh oh, yeah. wh what what's been there? Like uh what do they think about your AI work and all that stuff? Do you talk to them about it much? Oh yeah, and then now I'm teaching an AI class. I would say that the and you know, last semester was the first semester that we offered an AI, the photo department offered an AI class. And I thought it would be everybody filling up and everybody would want to take it and blah, 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 blah. And the, the, the initial feeling was fear. And uh, I think a reaction much like I had in the beginning, like, what is the stupid thing? Why do I have to learn this new thing? Like, is it going to be coding or something like that? Like, you know, like <laughs> how, how hard is it going to be? Do I have to do math, you know? Um, and so apprehensive, you know, but I would say that me using AI doesn't terrify me, but when I saw the work from the students that came out of the very first AI class that we offered, that's AI for visual artists, and I know how visually sophisticated some of these students are, and when I saw the work they produced, that's when I was terrified.
because it was like phenomenal. You know, it was just great. And it was like, oh, I didn't even know they could conceive of something like that much less, you know, with the subtlety and the, all of those things. And then they're just making the stuff. So it, it's changing many things, you know. Um, you know, one thing I was interested in talking about, because now you, you, you have an interesting perspective, like being a working photographer and now teaching photography. What do you think your job is as like a photography professor? Is it solely just to teach them the craft and the art and the history of photography? Or is, do you feel like you, you have a responsibility to like teach them how to have a career in this and like make a living? Like, how do you kind of balance those two things? Oh, yeah. I, the school that I work at is very vocational, you know, and like I had no background in education. I was hired simply because I was like the commercial guy who was interested in teaching and interested in the medium. So my school likes to bring in working professionals, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, definitely focused on the career. But I would say my bigger concern is I want to teach students how to find their independent voice how to really do what they're uniquely qualified to do that no one else could do, you know, and find a way to bring that. And as a student, you know, I mean, here, you probably feel at this point, maybe you know what you're uniquely qualified to do, but you've done it for years and years and years and years and years. The students, it's definitely, they're just finding a hint of it. But if you can find, get them on that path of like, this is my raison d'etre or whatever that word is, they, um, uh, that's the home run, you know. It is like teaching something you, you enjoyed like from the start or was it kind of like a learning process to like kind of figure out how to navigate that? Oh, no, I was not good at it from the start. Let's put it that way. I always wanted to be a teacher and, and do that, but I was not good at it. No, and there were classes that were disasters, you know, for sure. Um, but it's almost like as a photographer, you have tools that'll help you get out of, whatever given situation. And I don't mean gear, I mean like social tools or something that help you finesse the situation. Yeah, and starting teaching, I didn't have any of that. And so you only learn those things by doing, I think. You know? Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess to go back, like where'd you grow up and like how do you initially get into photography? Oh, sure. I grew up in Schenectady, New York on the East oh, Coast. Oh yeah, near Albany. Yep, Schenectady, Albany, Troy. And then uh, there's a great photographer who taught photography there uh, at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Martin Benjamin was his name, an amazing photographer. And uh, he let me come to some photo classes he was teaching. And then I you know, definitely got into photography then. Um, and it is something that you can, you can get into it young. You know what I mean? Like, when did you begin photography? Uh, probably like 14 or 15. Yeah, it seems like for a while of our age group, you saw that, you know, here at the school, I meet people who haven't picked up a camera until they're 35 or something like that. You know what I mean? That's kind of cool. That's, co that's too, cool, too, though. You know? <laughs> yeah, they haven't lived it for so long. They're more just like, oh, here, I'm doing this now, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, of course, I used to be bitter about that, where I dedicated my entire life to this thing, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, it is exciting to see that, you know. I mean, the other thing you see in school is you see students who are easily like the worst student in class, like they cannot grasp anything. And then in one semester, suddenly they're doing great work, you know, and I've heard them say like, yeah, no, I struggled with the technical things. And then once I got that passed, I could express myself, you know, and when you see that light bulb go off in their head, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. I remember being like, I went to photography school and uh, I remember it's like seeing some like people that were in my class with me and at the time in school they definitely struggled and like I didn't think they'd be photographers but now they're like killing it and I think it's just like school's an interesting thing like it's not it, it's 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 there's a structure to it like every school is different and some people that structure works for them some people don't so it's really is interesting to see like where people go you know like it's uh so I don't think it's like even if someone doesn't do good in school it's not like a it doesn't mean they're not going to have success down the line, I think. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's more about commitment, you know, like how committed they are to try to keep pushing this rock up the hill, you know. Yeah, have you ever, did you ever have any doubt in your career? Like you've been doing this a long time and, you know, there's a lot of 
I'm sure ups and downs and being a freelance, like work for hire. It's, I, I know it's, it's a hard uh, endeavor, but like it, what kind of kept you on the path for so long? Uh, you know, I think that I had timing on my side because I was able to take advantage of the golden era of magazines, you know, which is now over clearly, you know, but yeah, I love doing editorial and I thought I was, you know, uh, also before I was doing that type of work, I was shooting for, I had a job with uh, the Phoenix New Times and Alternative Weekly that did big photo essays. And so that was like a period where newspapers had a lot of money before Craigslist and before, um, you know, uh, the internet took away that advertising. So timing wise, I had the good fortune of being able to kind of capitalize on Mag um, newspapers when they had a lot of money and the alternative press allowed me to do kind of black and white photo essays, you know, and then magazines on the West Coast, when I came out to San Francisco, you know, there were so many, so much interest in the internet and computers and all these different alternative publications that, you know, I used to say like a monkey with a 5D could move, you know, to San Francisco in whatever that was like 90, 99 <laughs> dot com boom or whatever yeah 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 have a career um but so yeah uh, that allowed me to and, and like at the newspaper i learned how to be a better photographer and how to like build a voice and then i thought the magazines were so big you could shoot a lot and you could be doing trying a lot of different things you know and you had your peers who you were you were competing with you know and so that that was an exciting time that gave us all a lot of that bats to you know kind of grow and keep trying to push the medium a little bit because when you're first starting out as a photographer like what kind of stuff were you shooting and like did you was like being a photojournalist was like working for a newspaper was that kind of your goal early on or this kind of opportunity that kind of came about oh well the, i thought the cool thing that was happening in the 90s with the alternative press is they, you know, papers like Phoenix New Times and the Village Voice, they didn't do traditional photojournalism where they were photographing football games or car crashes or anything like that. It wasn't hard news. It was all long form writing and then photo essay type things. And so really coming out of college, that's what I wanted to do, you know, and I felt like I could just shoot black and white, 35 millimeter, Hasselblad later, two and a quarter, and kind of make storytelling images to illustrate these kind of long form stories and working with the writers. And so that was a unique time. I mean, the, the quality of work that the alternative press was putting out at the time, like heavily, I mean, writing, you know, the heavily edited and reported stories and uh, time to put into, like, I remember there was a photo essay I did on a motorcycle gang that I think I was able to work on for three months, you know, and the idea of working on that while you're doing your little boring assignments, that's a luxury of time, you know. So, no, that was exciting. And I think then I, uh, I was there for, I think, five years and then wanted to kind of be the magazine advertising photographer. Like, I think when those newspaper jobs, you feel like you're a senior in high school, one, one year too many, a little bit. Oh, yeah. I read that in the interview. You said you, you thought you stayed there a year too long. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're in the beginning, you're struggling with a the job. Then you kind of figure out how to do it. Then suddenly you're doing great work. And then suddenly you're bored and the quality of work goes down. You yeah. Know? You get, you get like comfortable and say, so yeah, it's hard to, it's uh yeah, it's hard to make that leap with anything. Like it is trying new stuff, you know, it's, uh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cause did you go to school for photography or did you study something else? Oh, I was an art major at Penn state. And so Penn state was, you know, just a big state school in Pennsylvania, but they had, it, Cause it was so big. They had a newspaper that came out every day that you could work, work at. And so I worked at the newspaper and then I was, had an art degree where I was learning painting and sculpture and esoteric photography and things like that. So I kind of had a foot in like the functional world of photography at the newspaper. And then the more arty world, you know, of like art photography and uh, that type of thing, you know, um so definitely an art major and were there like any photographers whose whose work kind of inspired you early on or like you kind of looked up to it all oh absolutely I always admired well it's funny at that period I mean I was always into the documentary photographers like Bruce Davidson you know um but I would say suddenly there was a shift 
and I was into Joel Peter Witkin, yep. you know, and Joel Peter Witkin was enormous at that time where he was not just constructing things, but he was scratching on the negative and then the images were these beautiful toned things. And I never worked in that way, but that type of pushing, getting away from documentary, using some of the reality of photography, but then making it like an art object, you know, I, I thought that was super exciting, you know? Yeah. Um, and, Cause like when you left the Phoenix new times, what did you do after that? Oh, so I was married at the time and my wife wanted to go to grad school mm -hmm. at, uh, somewhere. And so I was like, oh, wherever you go to grad school, we'll move, you know? And so she went to grad school at UC Davis, which is out by San Francisco. And so we moved there and then I just tried to, we had a house in Phoenix because that was a regular job. So we sold the house and I had time to just try to figure out how to start a career, you know? And of course, you think everyone is waiting for you, you know, because there's no way you would do it yeah. otherwise. Yeah, you think they, the world is waiting. Just wait till they see, wait till they see my portfolio, man. Just wait till they see. <laughs> I, even before they see it. Yeah. They're just, they're anticipating when you leave that job. Uh -huh. um, and I had made some connections at like the New York times Sunday magazine and things like that. And I had done little things in the bigger world while I was still at new times. So but it took, a, it took obviously, you know, a while until it felt like a career. Yeah. Cause how do you, cause I, I mean, that's a struggle, especially like moving to a new city. Like that, it feels like I, I've been the same. Uh, I've been in Boston forever. I have been my whole career here. And I, I even, yeah. sometimes I think about, it, I'm like, damn, if I moved to like some other city, like how would that work? Was that like a daunting thing? And like, once you got to San Francisco, like how did you kind of start getting your name out there and getting your first uh, uh, assignments, I guess. Yeah, these are good questions. You know, it wasn't daunting to move because Phoenix was so isolated and San Francisco was such a big deal at the time. You know, like San Francisco, Silicon Valley, it was so enormous. And it was like, I remember there were there were magazines coming out of Canada that were just focused on internet culture and like there was all this internet stuff. And so coming to San Francisco, no, it wasn't daunting. I probably viewed it as a new... Um, a clean slate, you know, um, and probably thinking there was more opportunities, but I did what everybody did. I would make, like I had a, a dark room in my house. I was still making prints in the dark room. I try to make handmade promotional pieces, mail them out, you know, and it's funny. There was, do you know, Kelly McMurray? Do you know who that is? Oh yeah. To, to communicate. To I work, communicate. I work with her all the time. She's the, she's the best. Yep. I think that I, knew you worked with her, which is probably why it was on my mind. But I remember I, I handmade some kind of promotional piece where I cut out my name in in the way like you cut out letters in a magazine, like if you are, if you kidnap someone, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I did my name that way and I sent it to her. And I remember she was like, oh, this looks like you're a kidnapper or a criminal or something. Here, do you want to do this assignment? You know, <laughs> and then I've known her for years. You know, now she's in Albany, New York, and I got together with her when I was out there. So I've been shooting for her for a long time. But I do remember she was the first person who kind of responded to, you know, um, these kind of simple homemade promo pieces I was sending out. You know, I think that's like the best way. I think we all complicate it too much. Like it, it, it's like you actually make something personal, personal. Like it probably it works better than like sign up for. I remember I signed up for like found folios. These sites, you like, oh yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, my mind was to set your money on fire. It, it, it's like, well, there's many things in photography that are like that. Yeah, that you think you're gonna do because it holds the key to the city, you know, yeah. and. But yeah, what works for one person doesn't work for another person. And, you know, I've had photographers call me up and be like, oh, did it help for you to be in the black book? And I'm just like, I don't know. You just do a lot. <laughs> if you, know? you got money, do it. Sure. <laughs> so, but it's like nowadays, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Now I do think the whole like paradigm has shifted and there's just more photographers now. Yeah. You think? Oh, yeah. There's a lot. Um, yeah. And there's some people that are doing it. It's like their side gig. And then there's people that are trying to do it full time. And then there's this like a mix of like, I don't know, there's a lot of work. I feel like uh, there's a lot of jobs out there where I feel like the client's just like, eh, this is good enough. We got something to throw out there. We got, we got content as they say, we'll, Absolutely. Just, we'll just throw it, which is like, it's a little deflating, but I don't know. I just kind of, uh, 
I don't know. I feel like it's easy to get like bitter, like try to think of like what it was before. But now it's just like if I want to keep doing this, I kind of just got to evolve with the times and try to adapt. And I don't know. At least try, at least I try to keep a positive attitude about it. I don't know. Oh, I well, I think that every generation looks at the previous, at the current photo marketplace, whatever it is, and says. Oh, well, no, it was better when I, you know, was in my heyday, whatever that was, you know, (laughs) because, yeah, everybody who I knew when I thought working in photography was a blast would romanticize what it was like in the 80s, you know. Um, But I would say working with the students here, they come out and they have no they have no baggage. They have no fear. Yeah, they aren't lamenting the past. They're just moving forward, you know. Yeah, they don't know what the past was. This is this is what it is. What we're the, the world we're living in now. It's even me. I've been trying to like, even the way like social media, like marking your photography. I've been trying different stuff, like making little like reels and videos, and like just seeing how it works. And it's actually it's kind of fun. Like it, I actually have always kind of enjoyed the marketing aspect of like photography. Obviously, making the work is my favorite. But it is like this little game. It's like, let me try this and like see how it works and like kind of throw stuff at the wall. So I've just been trying to be more open about this, trying different stuff, you know? Yeah, I always thought Chris Buck was a photographer who tried different things. Like I remember I got together with him once and he was like, oh, it's all about stickers this year. You know, like he wasn't as precious about these things. You yeah, know? yeah, you can have fun with it. I have my, my friend uh kareem black and matt salicuse they did a cool campaign years ago and they just they like wheat pasted like uh i think it, it was like some crazy like cream black marries Lindsay lohan and it had like oh, and they, seriously oh yeah and they like wheat pasted it around new york city and they got like mad traction from it I, they haven't that was like years ago but it was just like i was like that's cool man it's just oh that's like, great trying to fucking just have fun with photography and like even that's like i don't know it's just, like, I don't know, it's exciting to see when people try different stuff and see how it works, you know? Uh, oh, I like that idea a lot. It is funny, that whole wheat pasting onto walls is very big out here in San Francisco right now. For, oh, really? For artists, yeah. Yeah, do you know Michael Jang, who that is? Michael no, Jang? no, I'm not familiar. Oh, Michael Jang, Google that. He's a big deal. Um, uh, art slash photography, graffiti artist, but he's an old man. Okay. Okay. Um, He's, his stuff is amazing, but Thomas Browning was doing wheat paste things. And then uh, Harry Williams is like a street photographer who does these amazing wheat paste things. So there's a lot going on, you know. Yeah, no, San Francisco has always been a really creative place. I remember growing up, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Hamburger Eyes. Uh, they I were love like, Hamburger Eyes. Yeah, Absolutely. which is like started in San Francisco. And I remember like the same thing, reading their blog and they did all these cool zines and they had like a, at, at one point they had like a community dark room. And I was like, man, this, yeah. is, cool. this is cool as hell, dude. <laughs> like, oh, Hamburger Eyes is unprecedented. I teach the students about, I, I know nothing about them except what I've researched, you know, like I don't know the guy, yeah. but there's great videos on them and I share their work with the students all the time. You know? Yeah. And I guess for you and your work, uh like you're mentioning like trying to help photograph like students trying to find their voice and what they're good at like did it kind of take you a while to kind of figure out like what what you're best at and what kind of interests you and kind of finding your voice as a photographer oh uh that's an excellent question well i was always into photographing people and i was always so that was my interest so there was it was never i was never not gonna do that but I do remember doing some shoot with like this chef uh, when I was at the Phoenix New Times. It was a studio shoot. And I remember coming home and saying to somebody, oh, I really think that there was this ball of energy between me and the guy. Like there was a ball of energy. We were able to connect and do different things and move forward. And the photos worked out great. And I felt like we had this creative connection. And I remember being like, "Uh, did it really happen? Am I just imagining this? What is it? But then I think I learned how to tap into that a little bit and chase that. And so that ability to probably connect with the subject when it can happen and it can't always happen was the thing that, you know, propelled me. And then probably also I realized that like, I didn't want to photograph celebrities. I was intimidated by them. Every time I had to photograph even like a comedian, it was a disaster. Why is that? Were you trying to get them to do like funny stuff or like, why was it a disaster? Yeah, I think that the, uh, 
I think it would be an art director would be like, they're going to do some crazy thing. And then we would pitch it to them and they would be like, well, no, I'm not a clown. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a writer who writes, you know? So yeah, I think a disconnect between wants and needs there, you know, but I think also, I think I'm intimidated by celebrity. And so that I was always most at ease with your average person, a real person, you know? And I think that drove my career where I did a lot of things like for pharmaceutical companies where we're shooting the, the, the person who's using the medication, you know, creating a little lifestyle libraries of that type of work. Um, and then magazine portraiture, for sure. A lot of the stories I did were just of real people. So I think you, that type of thing, you know. And you kind of talk about like having these shoots where you kind of connect with the subject and that's always the dream. Uh, but then I'm sure you've had plenty of them where you don't connect and it's just you can kind of leave deflated and this kind of like, I don't know, I feel like you kind of got beat up a little bit. But like, how do you kind of rebound from those ones? Because I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've had them. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, so many bad photo shoots. You know, the one thing when I was younger, I used to truly feel that these things were alpha battles where I had to like, and as insane as the sounds, but like I had to pretend I was the beta so I could become the alpha and dominate the photo shoot. And because you're laughing, I think you get it. Kind of, oh yeah this know. is like a psychology and but, but sometimes we we like build i'm like we build up these scenarios in our head with someone we're going to shoot and then you get there and it's like different than what you spent like a week like like yeah. going back and forth in your head and you're <laughs> yeah it's, it's a lot of mental gymnastics for sure that and so that used to torment me and i don't know if it led to good work that type of alpha beta battle you know and then i think i mean so i have kids that are grown now and I think after raising kids and everything, I kind of let go of that. And uh, I'm more just trying to relate to them like you would relate to anybody like in the most unpretentious way possible. Like it's not about winning. It's about together, we're going to work on this thing together and make it great, you know. And so I think probably raising kids made me realize that you can't you can't strong arm the thing into success. You got to find a way to just harmonize, you know? Cause like, how do you, like when you walk into a shoot, say like, yeah, for instance, you're going to go photograph some chef, you walk into his restaurant, like, what does that look like? Or do you try to talk to them for a while, explain what you want to do or like kind of, how do you kind of approach assignment work, I guess? Oh yeah, no assignment work to me, the secret weapon, I think all photographers have their secret weapon, their little tool, you know? What is yours? Do you have one? uh i don't know i just i, I don't know i i don't know i guess yeah it's, and I, now i think about it i was trying to be pretty low-key and just trying to just not be because i remember assisting uh i don't know if you assisted but i assisted for years and got to see how a lot of people work and like some people i don't know maybe it works from it, it's like it's like they're putting on a show like it's about the photographer and oh like, yeah yeah it's like this yeah. whole like and it always just turned me off and i was just like I always appreciated, like I worked for this guy, Tyber Nemeth, who's a great photographer. Oh yeah. And he was just this super low key, like this kind of like, Hey, like, what's up? Like, what are you doing this weekend? Like, what's it got? Fa this like basic shit. Like, where do you like to go eat? Like, what's your favorite restaurant? Like seen any good movies lately? Like this basic, I don't know, I guess it's small talk, but not like this grandiose, like we're going to yeah. do this. And it's going to look like Vogue and it's going to be da da da. Yeah. Like that yeah. should always just maybe want to puke. <laughs> no, whenever I see a video of Richard Avedon in interview, it's like that. It's like, yeah. you know, he's toasting people. You know what I mean? Like, and I was always like, can he really relate to people like that? Cause I love his photographs. You know what I mean? But it always seems like a, like a society party or something. It's like, it's like pandering. It feels like, it's just like, it just seems like bullshit a little bit, you know, like, yeah, but obviously with Avedon, it's working, you know what I mean? And I guess it, you can't argue with what works. But yeah, with me, the whole, the secret weapon for a portrait shoot is scouting on a separate day and then meeting the person in an unpretentious way, the day, another day that you don't have to shoot. Oh, really? And, You'll meet them beforehand? Yeah. And like, I do a lot of work for Stanford University and say there's a scientist in a lab and I want to photograph the idea that I could stop into the, into the lab, 
figure out every place I wanna shoot, make sure no one's gonna shoot there. So there's no, or make sure no one's doing something on the day we shoot. Look at the light, figure out like, can I just use natural light? Am I gonna bring light in? What am I gonna do? Let's turn off all the lights, see the natural light here. And then if I could have, if I could meet the person I'm photographing, it takes the pressure off in terms of them. Like they can see I'm just a nerd. I'm not Richard Avedon, I'm just this guy, you know, yeah. who's like, brainstorming with them about what would be cool to wear for the shoot and then when you meet when you're on your shoot day you've already gone through the pleasantries and you've already gone through the technical things you're just together yeah you kind of like feel each other out and kind of build like a level of i don't know trust before the shoot a little bit or something that yeah, yeah. now you don't always have that luxury to meet the people or to scout beforehand or a- any of those things but every time i can i do and it always works out better yeah and do you feel like you do you feel like your style and approach has changed much over the years to like portraiture and like the assignment work you do or is it kind of you feel like you kind of kind of steady over the course of your career oh no it's always been different like for a while I was into really lighting you know what I mean and uh a complex series of lights and where that I could just do in any situation and it would look like my work you know and then later I got into just natural light And then I think the scouting has a lot to do with that, where if I'm able to scout, I scout at the time we're going to do the shoot. And then so figure out where that light is good and what I need to augment that natural light, you know. And so I try to, as much as possible, shoot with all natural light when I'm able to scout. And by natural light, I mean, we're using reflectors, we're using V-flat, we're using all those things, but not a strobe or not a continuous source light. What do you like about that uh, approach to lighting, you think? I think it feels more wild where when something is lit, be it with a strobe or with a continuous source light, and is even mixing with natural light, it still has a feel of commercialism, kind of like, you know, the photographer is controlling everything and it's, it's, it's crisp and clean and those digital files are so precise and all of that where with natural light, there's more ways, you know, same natural light with a very wide aperture, like there's light coming from different things and there could be flare and then you could have the focus be off a little bit, but it still works. And so I think in the march towards perfection that we're all doing with digital cameras, it allows things to be a little more raw. Yeah, that's right. I appreciate about your work, like even like the Sutter Street stuff. Like it kind of looks like almost like obviously you're still directing them, I would imagine. Like yeah. you're like standing yeah. here, but it almost seems it just seems like a more organic moment, even though you're still crafting it, you're putting them in, in the right light, turn this way, whatever. But uh it's just very I don't know, I, I always appreciate that type of work where it's just kind of yeah, it's just more raw and organic, I guess. It's more approachable, I would say. Well, I, I always thought like Arthur Tress, you know, his work. Oh, yeah. Love. He has had an insane. I didn't get to go. He had a show in uh, in L.A. at that. Uh, what's that? The Getty Museum, I think it was like. Oh, yeah. 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 Was, yeah. Arthur Tress legend. So definitely legend. And what I always liked about his photos were. And I'm thinking of the ones with people. He could have people do absurd, crazy things with odd objects and stuff. But because they were natural light and they looked like it was just done with like a Hasselblad, it didn't look like some cheesy commercial photo illustration. It looked like real people actually doing an unusual thing, you mm-hmm. know? And so it's almost like it had a foot in documentary photography, but then there was direction and fantasy happening, you know? Yeah, I love his work. It's just so much. I love that he's, he's always a shot like two and a quarter. And it's just like his, this light and shadow. Like it's, to be able to go out in the world and create that type of work with no like it's that's uh, that's like the hardest thing to do i feel like just go out in the world like that and create stuff out of nothing it's i'm not yeah because like i'm just like i'm a portrait guy so it's like portraits it's kind of easy like you find like a interesting character it, it kind of does have to work for you like you can find a location but this to like make that type of work man it's 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 impressive um it, yeah it is no i'm thankful he's still around yeah you know and people are discovering him anew yeah definitely um you know one body of work i know you're real well known for uh i'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of this but it's called 
Echo Echolilia. Is that how you say? Oh yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, which is a project you worked on uh, with your son. Um, but how did that kind of project come about? And like, what was your approach to making that work? Yeah, no, that that project's never going away. You know, people are still like discovering that and writing to me about it. And we're going to have a show in Italy this April nice. of that work. And so it definitely opened doors for me. It is. Uh, so my son, Eli, was uh, when he was five, we started making those photos and we did them between five and eight. And, you know, age five to age eight. And it really was like parenting was not easy for me. It was a struggle. It didn't come naturally, you know, to me. And, you know, it did get to be you know, like in the home. Every minute was like, I was, a, I was a photographer who was interested in being out in the world, you know, and the, uh, with Eli, definitely life was all about why is Eli behaving this way? Why is he getting sent home from school? Why is he acting this way, he, he, it feels unusual to be with him, what, what, what is happening? And I think because it was, it was occupying everything and taking all the oxygen out of the room, the, I was like, well, let me make pictures of him and then maybe I could show him to a doctor and we could figure out what, what the problem was or if we, the doctor could see what he's doing, maybe he could say, oh, I've seen this before or something like that. So there was that concern but then there was also the idea of like well let's just do something together like rather than running away from a problem let's let me give him some undivided attention and let's see what comes of this you know and definitely like I could never tell him to do anything like brush his teeth or put away his toys or anything he did whatever he wanted and when we started making pictures together he wanted to do things and then have me photograph him and so a lot of those pictures came from him being like either something he was just naturally doing like there's a picture of him with this big log he's sitting on a big bed and there's like a log and that was like just an object he got fascinated with for a week or two weeks and so then it was like let's make a photograph of you in the log and I figured he'd want to do it in the backyard but he wanted to do it in his bedroom like that you know <laughs> and so the the thing I found though is if I let him lead the photos were more exciting. They didn't look like something I would do because if I did it, it would to be predictable or self-conscious or something like that. Where if it was something he would do, it had a, a feeling like any collaboration. Suddenly you get someone else's ideas in the mix and it's exciting, you know? So that project was that. Um, we did that for three years. And then it was clear. I always tell the story that there was this point where I would photograph him, he would photograph me because he was into operating the cameras, you know, camera on a tripod. And it was like a little game, you know, that we had. And I remember once he was like, well, let me photograph you in the backyard with a garbage can on your head. And I was like, oh, I get it. We, we've already, and that was like a photo we had done a couple years earlier. And I was like, oh, I get it. We're not really learning anything new anymore. Now we're just walking in these footsteps that we've walked already. And so that I think for a project for me, that's when I stopped it. And then, you know, I was like, all right, I think, I think we got this project, you know, is it, and you know, is there any hesitancy like to make a project and put your kid out there like that? You know, cause a lot oh, of yeah. projects have done it. Everyone from like Sally Mann or uh, Christopher Anderson and people make books and projects like, like what made you want to put the work out there? Is there like any hesitancy or like, how do you kind of bounce that? I'm sure like your partner had a, opinions too. Like what was kind of oh, your yeah. thought process of like putting that out in the world? Yeah, no, it was, it, uh, well, I would say at the time I didn't think anything about it. And when I was doing that project, I was, it was in those early days of blogging and I liked the idea that I was putting these pictures out. I had a little audience and I could put this project I was working on out. And then it's kind of like all of us, what we do with Instagram now, where it's like you have a little audience, you can keep feeding something. So I'm not one to think of what's going to go bad. I'm more one who just does. But I would say that I do recall the New York Times saw the project and they were going to put it on their lens blog which is like they had a forum for photography and they would have a writer write a story about it 
And I remember I was just very busy and there was all sorts of stuff going on. And so they talked to me, the writer talked to me and then the, they made their edit of the photos and I, I wasn't really thinking. And then I remember the night before it came out, I was like, oh, it's going to be on the internet. This is going to be like my kid in a plastic container on the internet. I haven't really thought about these things I'm saying. This could go bad, very bad, you know, and it could be the entire weight of the internet come crashing down on me, you know, just because I didn't think it through or something. And so uh, it was a gamble. And then uh, in the beginning, there were accusations of this person, like, how can you collaborate with a child? You can't, a kid can't give you permission to collaborate, you know? And then other more absurd accusations, like, you know, that kid's in a plastic container, he can't breathe, you know, like uh, things like that, of people who didn't really understand the project. Um, but I will be honest, it was a gamble. You know, and then here just last weekend, two weekends ago, Eli was back and we had like a family kind of barbecue and someone who was there asked him, they said, oh, do you have any, any, you know, apprehensions about participating in this project with you? And he said, uh, honestly, I don't. He's like, but I do see how someone else at a different time like the project became, I think the person said, is this your SEO? Meaning, is this your, like, if you search under your name, Eli, does this come up? And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, no, it does. Like I'm tied to this, whether I want it or not, you know? Um, but he said, now nah, I kind of saw it for the greater, I see it now for the greater good. And at the time it was just something fun to do together. And so I'm okay with it, but there was an acknowledgement that a different kid at a different time in a different scenario, it could have gone bad and there's no, no turning back, you know, like it, it would be very hard to say, okay, I'll pull everything down from the internet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. It is a, it is a difficult thing. Um, I guess in the process of making that work, um, did you learn anything just kind of getting to collaborate with your son and make that work? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would say it was probably the most like profound experience of my life. Like, because I think, uh, Parenting to me is a big deal and was a big deal. My kids are grown now, so I'm kind of done parenting necessarily, mm -hmm. but the, it definitely was like the defining thing in my life. And I was the classic photographer who was like, nothing matters to me except photography. That's all I care about. Now, when I had kids, I saw the true power of that, you know? Um, and, but I think that what it taught me was that like when Eli and I were working on that project, it was for the first time we could really connect and we were working together as equals rather than father and son or rather than me being frustrated because he's doing something. I could, we could find a way to be equals for a little second and work on something together. And that did kind of was the foundation of our relationship. And so it taught me that like, I don't think that project is about autism or about parenting. I think it's about the power of relationships, you know, and uh, like any in relationship, what you put into it is what you get out of it. And if you're running from that relationship or if you're not putting the energy into that relationship, it's going to suffer. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, and at, at this point, you're, do you still, are you someone who like photographs their family a lot? Like even, even if you're not showing it or do you still kind of photograph your son when, when you guys get together? Or like, what does that look like now? No, it was really about that period, you mm -hmm. know? And there was a period where my two kids, when they were like, uh, oh, like Instagram was new and my two kids were probably like 10 and eight and they were adorable and we would be doing all these things as a family and I'd be taking their picture and Instagram was a great, you know, the phone could take great photographs. And so I was into kind of get nurturing that reputation as the dad photographer, you know, and then commercially I got a lot of jobs that were about understanding kids, you know. Um, but no, at this point, there was a point where the kids said, ah, don't photograph us anymore. We have our own social medias. We have our own lives. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't want to be your project anymore. And and when you have, like, I guess, success in terms of, like, obviously, it was a big project for you and it got, like, press and stuff. Is it hard to move on from that project? Like, because it's, oh, yeah. like, it's got to be weird because it's like, yeah, it's it's like, yeah, you as a photographer, we're, we're all, we're all, we all love attention, dude. Like we all like want to look at my stuff, whatever, like, it, it, and 
But like, how do you move on from that project and start something new when you have, because I think as a photographer, we all make pictures all the time. And when you're looking at your work, I would say that that's one of the most powerful projects you've done. And it's like some of your best work. And, you know, then there's other projects you do. It's not, it's not that it's good or bad, but it's never, I would imagine it's not the same as that. And trying to like, yeah. move on to start a new project. Like, is that, is it kind of difficult, you know? Cause. Oh yeah. 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 No, uh, no. All of those things. Yeah. Like that project caught me by surprise that it got so much attention and that people got it. But I think timing was a thing. Autism was big at that time and people didn't know how to portray it. And then suddenly here's a project that puts like a face to it. And then that project had these like iconic photographs like that people grabbed onto, you know, the, uh, no, there was, I couldn't do it again. And I knew I couldn't do it again. Like there couldn't be like, a, here's like the next one, you know, we're going to do, do dyslexia next or whatever. Yeah. Like, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think I understood that it wasn't, it was a blip and it wasn't like, I'm, there's other photographers who have done like say Mary Ellen Mark would always have like project documentary project after documentary project and she's doing the Indian circus and then she's doing Twins. you know the homeless kids or yeah or something and so no I knew that that thing was so kind of personal that it was a little you know blip in the road but I think when you look at photographers I think John Sarkowski or something said most photographers make their best work only during a three to five period, three to five year period of time, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know about best. I think that's a weird word, but like work that speaks to people, I think you're just lucky if you get it. You know yeah, what I mean? Definitely. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, you know, one, one thing I was interested in talking about, I saw this post on your Instagram. I was kind of curious, kind of understand more about it. It was, it was like a picture of a TV and it said, why I just cannot with Annie Leibovitz. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. You, you said you got like more traction from that picture than you'd posted anything. Like, what was kind of the story behind that post? So yeah, no, the story behind that was I was teaching a class which was senior portfolio, and one of so senior portfolio is a class that the students who have our photo majors are creating their final portfolio before graduating, and the assignment was bring in the work of someone. One week we had to bring in work of someone who we are inspired by. And then the next week we had to bring in work of someone who we actively dislike. And I'm a big believer that those photographers that we dislike, a lot of times we dislike them because, well, maybe, maybe their work is like ours. Maybe there is something in there. Like I used to really dislike Ralph Eugene Meatyard. Do you know who that is? Meatyard? I'm not familiar with his work, no. Meat Yard was like shooting in the 1920s and he had like weird pictures of children dressed up in masks and uh, dark and then playful and with kids. And I used to hate his work in college. I thought it was so obvious and so predictable. But if you look at like every project of mine that's got attention, Meat Yard, it looks exactly like Meat Yard. Like the project with my son, Eli, it's got overtones of meat yard in it. Sun, and so, sunset, sunsets early, like some of that stuff. Yeah, that, yeah, no, <laughs> that, yeah, that Halloween project, it's meat yard. Absolutely. Yeah. So I do believe that if we can identify those who we, we hate, you know, we dislike, that it tells us something about ourselves, you know, about our goals. And so this student came in and had created a PowerPoint presentation that had that as the opening statement. Uh, what did it say? I just can't with Annie Leibovitz. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I just. I, what did it say? I got, why I just cannot with Annie Leibovitz? Question. I think. It's, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was interesting. And she, you know, here I feel that the students don't understand the power of Annie Leibovitz and the enormous career she's had and the different things she's done, and they just know her little now you know like they don't know the history of rolling stone magazine and how influential those pictures were but uh but i'm open to all everybody's opinions important you know in school and uh, yeah the the student did a good job of spelling out how she's uncomfortable with the way annie photographs african-american women and the skin texture and skin color mm -hmm. which you've probably seen on the internet there's like upheaval about that um the old rumor that Annie doesn't know how to light and her assistants do all the light, which has been going on since like 1910, you know? Yeah. 
And then uh, the big post-production thing she had done for Disney, you know, where people are like flying through the air and they're Peter Pan and, you know, and she was just like these overproduced. Yeah sloppy you know things and so yeah, it was those were the point but it was interesting in class it was no big deal the students were like oh okay no that's cool yeah who's Andy Leibovitz let me see who that is oh I, I didn't really know her work all right let's let's see yeah no I could see why you dislike it but when I posted it to the internet it like like Barack Obama chimed in you know damn no no, no it, but, yeah, it, it was that type of thing it got a lot of attention you know? yeah she's a big name and people got opinions and everything it's uh yeah it's interesting yeah, it must be interesting being a teacher getting to hear the younger kids like opinions about photographers and things like that because it's just they're coming from a different perspective i guess oh yeah no I, there was this one student who is a great photographer and he's working now who wrote a big essay in class about how diane arbus is is a terrible photographer and her work is outlandishly overrated and the prints are too dark and they're sloppy. And that if her work was turned in in a class, it would get an F. Oh my God. <laughs> and so I love, this is, you know, hearing these viewpoints, it's, it's exciting, you know? Yeah. Tastes are different. Like there's, there's actually, I mean, I've said this a million times on the podcast. There's like photographers whose work from like a visual, like creative standpoint, I don't really, it doesn't resonate with me. But I'm still like a fan because they just like they're just always making work. You know what I mean? Like, and that's the thing that like I really respect that more than anything is just people that are still doing it. Like, and I think for you being a professor, because I remember being in college and there was professor. I had great professors, but then there are some professors who are just like they were checked out and they weren't even making work. They hadn't made work in decades. Oh uh, yeah, you see that a lot. Which, which yeah, to me was sure. just like I just had no respect. Like I was just like, how are you like? For you, how do you bounce that? Like, obviously, you've been a photographer forever, and you're still, you still have the enthusiasm to make work still. Like, I do. Well, I mean, there is the thing that, like, when I'm work, to me, having a personal project, be it the, the sunsets early, the Halloween thing that I would shoot in October, or the AI thing now, or the project with Eli, or yeah, I've had other things that are, have gotten no attention, but I'm always working on. I mean, commercial photography, as you know, and by that, I mean, anything you're doing, you're getting paid for, you know, there's ups and downs and there's periods where everybody loves you. And then there's periods where no one wants to hire you. And I never wanted that to break my relationship with photography, you know? And so I felt like if I always had a, career, a personal project, well, that could be my safe place. And then Oh, if someone hires me, that's great. We're going to do a great job on that, you know, but if they don't, well, I still have this other thing. And so I've always tried to keep those things going. And then now that, I mean, my job now is I'm the director of this photography department, the on-site version of this photography department. And so teaching is a blast. All the administrative stuff I was not prepared for. And there is a learning curve, you know, with those things. And so staying creative and trying to keep these things going you need that counterbalance, you know, definitely as you're becoming, your work is more, you know, about Excel files and PDF files and, you know. Yeah. Cause what, what do you love about photography these days? Like what, what keeps, like you were saying, like what keeps you excited about it? What, after doing it for so many years, like what, what, what kind of excites you now? No, oh, that's a good question. Oh, uh, there's always a pull and I've probably never been as absorbed in it as I am now, because now I've got the thing at the school where I'm looking at students work all the time and I'm talking about photography. And then there's a technical aspect to these things I'm teaching. Blah, 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 blah. And so there's that. And then I have the shoots and I'm shooting the. Uh, yeah, I've probably never been as absorbed by it as I am right now, even though I always thought I was. Uh, I, I don't I think it's almost like asking you who your favorite photographer is. I would assume you can't because you have a relationship with the medium that's so big that it, it's just too big. And so it's hard to encapsulate. And that's probably how I would answer this. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. It's, it's more just, like yeah, it's, yeah, it's just your whole life. It's your whole life. Yeah, you're this like in golf with it everywhere and from teaching and shooting and it's just, it's a, uh... Because for you, like, what do you pursuing this as a career path is uh, 
it's a crazy uh because even i saw some interview you did you were like yeah there's no there's no map for this and there's oh, no yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it really is just gambling there's no like everyone's different like what i'm doing is different than what you're doing and like what like thomas Browning's doing is different than what we're doing and it's just like there's no like straight path trajectory um but what it is about this career path do you think you've enjoyed most over the years of being able to actually make a career out of this Oh, uh, probably the image making, the meeting people, the, uh, you know, when I was doing a lot of the magazine work, there was this idea that we were moving the ball forward, whether we were or weren't. Like, I think I, it used to be important for me to try to see the most challenging photo I could get a magazine to print, you know, whether anyone noticed that or not, I don't know, but it was like those little wins of trying to break a norm or something like that, you know? So in that period, now I think I'm just trying to enjoy the process mm. and uh, connect with the people I'm photographing. It's almost like it's more humble for me now, you know? I would say that the picture making has gotten easier the longer you do it. like or maybe simply because I have so much going on, I can't put all the worrying into a shoot like I used to, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Cause I'm juggling school and juggling a shoot and you know, like there's, uh, there's all those things, but the, I mean, uh, the one thing I would say though is now, so I'm 57, there's an end, you know what I mean? There will be a day I'm not teaching anymore and there will be a day no one's calling me to take photos anymore. And so I'm trying to learn and successfully, like I like my downtime. Like I like working in the garden with my wife and I like mm -hmm. uh, doing non-photo things too, you know, where I feel like in those, that period where you're really trying to get a career off the ground, you're living and breathing it so much and everything else is a distraction, you know? And I think I'm probably... Which, over that hump it, which point. is actually probably the opposite of what you should <laughs> it's like you actually you know yeah you should go live life and uh actually it would actually uh inform your work i think and like uh find inspiration that way sometimes i feel like for me at least for me like doing other yeah stuff. that yeah. that and i think yeah the classic thing and that's probably what i meant about parent parenthood where with me i think i was like oh man if i have kids i'm just going to distract me from you know laying out the next black book ad or something pathetic like that you know and what i realized is it took me out of my own head where my life wasn't just about me anymore. It was about the world now, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I think we all have these little, for me, it was probably parenthood for other people. It's probably something else. And you can have those revelations no matter what you're up to, you know? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I saw on your Instagram, you photographed JD Vance. Like I think it was like oh, yeah. seven or eight years ago. What, what, yeah. what, what was that guy? What was your uh, experience photographing that guy? Well, it was interesting. Yeah, I, very rarely do I shoot someone who then suddenly is prominent, you know, and but that one was and so that was for uh, Wall Street Journal. And I was doing a lot of work for them at the time. And I remember they spelled it out to me, they were like, well, there's this guy, he's a writer. Um, and I love writers, you know, and like, so JD Vance, he's a writer, and he wrote this book, which is the best selling book, it's called Hillbilly Elegy. And I hadn't read the book. But then I was like, well, where are we meeting him? Like at his house or something? Or And they were like, oh, no, at his venture capital office. And I was like, oh, that's not what I'm expecting. And he wasn't, uh, usually writers and photographers have some harmony. Like they're yeah. both creating with the written word or, you know, with the photos. And there is some, they're both creating. Oh, I love know? photographing artists more than anything, because at least in my experience, they understand like the process of like when like I photographed the guy he's like a ceramicist recently and yeah I didn't feel rushed at all like he understood like I was yeah I was like crafting making something so there's like a like a language there which is different than like shooting some like corporate business guy you know that yeah, yeah. and so I was like oh it's gonna be fun to photograph this writer you know let me see and the experience wasn't like that it was at a venture capital office there was a handler JD was was relative. I mean, I didn't know his politics, and I don't think at the time I photographed him that he had those politics, you know. Um, but eh, he was nervous and not he wasn't someone who would meet you, you know, mm -hmm. and he was nervous and just kind of followed direction, 
you know, yeah. but it was interesting. There's a, there was a video that came out last week of him in a donut shop. Have you seen oh, that? Oh, yeah, brutal. <laughs> brutal. <laughs> brutal. He, and JD Vance couldn't be a photographer, dude. I'll tell you that much. Like interacting oh, with other human beings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, you know, when I saw that video, I was like, okay, I get why this is bad. I wonder if everybody else will get it. But I do think that, yeah, as photographers, we need to come into a place and make people like us for a little bit and then connect with them. And it was like, ooh, he, he does not have that skill set. You know. or just yeah don't make someone uneasy <laughs> he made everybody uneasy. and that's not even a pol politics thing it was just like trying to talk to another person like i don't know it was wild <laughs> it was a great video but yeah he was like that like he wasn't able to make small talk and he just kind of wanted the shoot to be over you know yeah i kind of no insights you know i didn't have any insights in a weird way i kind of like i've had those shoots where you can tell it's like for people who you're photographing sometimes it's just it's just the thing they have to do in their day. Like it's just, they have to do this and they're trying to, it's like going to the dentist where I, so. I kind of early on in my career, I would like be so nervous about those ones. But now I'm like, I kind of like appreciate the challenge. Like I'm going to, I'm going to flip you, man. I'm going to, I'm going to crack you, dude. Like I'm, I'm going to figure out what you're into and like try to get into a conversation. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but I kind of, in a right. way, kind of like that challenge sometimes. Oh, that's interesting. You know, it's funny to talk about that portrait dynamic, though. Do you know Kevin Scanlon, who that is? Kevin sounds, fr sounds familiar. He is a celebrity shooter out of L.A., and he's a great photographer, and I knew him in Phoenix. Uh, he worked at a camera store there, but he, he is a, a great work, portrait photographer. And he photographed me one time I was in L.A., and he said, oh, the, and but he's photographed like Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt or, you know, like the top celebrities. Mm -hmm. And I had said to him, oh, I'm, I'm intimidated by these people. I, I wouldn't even know what to say, you know? And he's like, yeah, well, that's the difference. He's like, when I photograph the celebrity, this is Kevin talking. He's like, I am just the plumber. They know how they want to be photographed. They know the look they want to give me. I'm simply operating the camera and then the shoot's done. He's like, when you photograph someone, you want to like, like them or get them to like you. And you want to try to create that mini relationship in 20 minutes, but you can't do that with the celebrities. You can only do that with like the housewife or something like that. Yeah. And I thought his point, I thought that was so valid, you know, what he said. Yeah. They're just there to, uh, it's like a task. They need to, they need to show up, get it done. And there's no, there's no, uh, no banter as you'd say like this there's no not much back and forth it's just like bing bang boom a little bit more i guess yeah i think so i remember there was this big ad shoot we did for a pharmaceutical company and we had to hire a, an actor out of new york to play a doctor and you know so we hired this guy you know just out of a we didn't it just chose him from a list and so i'm meeting with him beforehand and i'm trying to coach him on how i want him to act and he was like look, I, I've been an actor for 40 years. Like, he's like, I know how to play a doctor. I don't need you to tell me how to play a doctor. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. And, and I'm like, ah, who is this guy? What does he know? And then he was the most amazing doctor you have ever seen. And it wasn't overacted. <laughs> it wasn't underacted. He could just like look someone in the eyes and hold their hand. And he was a doctor, like he knew how to deliver this. And so it, yeah, it was interesting. I, I underestimated just his skill set. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I guess to wrap up, man, like what's next for you? Obviously you got the AI camera club you've been working on and teaching and everything you're shooting with the Sutter Street, but like anything you're hoping to work on moving forward or anything you're kind of excited about? Oh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, for the past year and a half, that AI project has uh, it, it has fascinated me and pulled me along. And I am a big believer that, like, if it's work to work on a project, like the best projects pull you along, and they're easy to finish because, or they're easy to move it forward because it's pulling you and it's making you want to do more. And I have wondered with this one, like the AI camera club hit a stride last Halloween where I was able to make all these Halloween images that look historic and fascinating. And then I was like, well, if I do that again, that's just going to be the same thing. And so I may need to end that project and then do something with it. And it is funny, like we've made prints of those AI images and originally I didn't take the project very seriously. And then when we printed them, I was like, 
oh my God, look how beautiful that is, you know? And by beautiful, I don't mean like a photograph. I mean, like things were just pixelated and then other things were perfect. And then some things were messy and some noses weren't resolved, but all <laughs> those aberrations were what made it special, you know? And so I feel like I want to do something with that body of work, edit it to make sense of it, and then bring it out in the real, you know, out of your phone and into the printed matter. So I don't know what that is yet, but uh, yeah, we'll see. As far as the shooting project, eh, I don't know. I don't think I have anything uh, just day by day. Awesome. Trying well, to get through every day. Yeah, man. Well, excited we connected, Timothy. Like I said, yeah. I've, been, I've been aware. It's weird how like the internet is just like, I've like known who you are and you work for like almost two decades now. So glad, glad we had the time to connect and I uh, appreciate you taking the time to do this. Totally fun. No, it was a blast. Thank you. So there you have it. That was the Timothy Archibald episode. I uh, just want to thank Timothy for taking the time to come on the podcast. Real pleasure talking to him about his journey with photography and his recent AI project that he's been doing. Um, so I can't thank him enough. Definitely go check out Timothy's work. His website is timothyarchibald.com. And you can follow him on Instagram at timothy underscore archibald. Um, but I'll put his links in the show notes and you can go check his work out there. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, the photo banter video version is now available on YouTube and Spotify. All you got to go do is go hit the subscribe button over at YouTube, the photo banter page, and you can get the video version there. Um, but as always, thanks so much for listening and take care.